is the 18th of June, 2014. We're here to talk about the Shanghai Tower. This project's been going on for eight years, and it, the core was topped out in August of 2013. So a lot has been done since then, and in the last year of construction, there's a lot of simultaneous things going on. The superstructure, steel and concrete work, should be completed by the end of the year. We are about um, 590 meters height to date, plus or minus, and that'll be the roof. The exterior wall structure has to go up, and the enclosure, the enclosure is about 80% complete. We've started the enclosure on level eight, completed it up to about level 115. And this is the world's tallest double skin building, so we have two layers. We have the inner skin and then we have the outer skin, and that's about 80% complete. Simultaneously, the interior fit out is being done for the lift lobbies and toilets. So we have the amenity floors being fitted out, we have the lighting rails being put in, and we've started to put on all the cladding on the podium. The podium skin has been uh, put in place by Ling Yuan. There's a gold glass cladding that goes over a majority of the podium. There's a uh, white stone wall that covers the north side with a big picture window in it that shows off the retail. Um, so basically, to date, the tower from level 8 to level 115 is pretty much complete, superstructure and exterior wall. We can start doing the public areas, and now we have to focus on the very top, and we have to focus on the first five floors. So we, we've started to look again at the landscape around and make sure that is all in place, and that'll probably start in the next couple months, all the cladding for the ground plane and the trees and the landscape will be put in. It's a very, very tight site. It's 30,000 square meters, and there's a perimeter of construction offices that wrap the site that now have to be removed and the ground plane put on. So in the last year of construction, a lot of simultaneous things have to happen, and it's usually at the top of the building and the bottom of the building. At the top of the building, we have to put in the TMD, the Tune Mass Damper, which is a big weight that actually allows the building to resist high winds in terms of comfort. It's a big weight that moves out of phase with the building to make it feel more comfortable. This is also amenity to the building where we'll sell tickets to actually see this large weight. The trouble is, only in high winds will you see the weight moving. So when you go see this apparatus, you, you probably won't see it moving. Usually these are about one to one and a half percent of the weight of the total building. So this is a lot of weight. I don't know the exact number, but it's a huge piece of steel. And the way it's gonna be built is they're building a frame and then they're placing pieces of flat steel up and creating this big mass weight. So uh, it's on pistons and it's actually hanging from a double pendulum. So as the building moves, the, the weight moves out of phase and creates a much more comfortable building. This has nothing to do with the strength of the building, it only has to do with the comfort of the building. And that takes an awful lot of time because there's a lot of small pieces of steel that make up the weight of this TMD. Um, up from the TMD we'll have the roof and then we'll have some cooling towers. And then we'll have a structural system that supports the crown. Now, one of the things that's very interesting is the way that we built the building. The building is really eight zones of eight small buildings stacked up on top of each other, and they're all built in the same way. We build the core up, then we build the amenity floors, and then we hang the curtain wall supporting structure, and then we hang the outer skin, and then we hang the inner skin. So we have to go up, and then we come down with construction, and then we go back up. This changes at level 121, in order to reduce the construction time, the client asked us to redesign the crown from going up, hanging a structure, and then going up and finishing the cladding, to actually building the crown up from level 121 so you can actually follow with the construction of the exterior wall so we do not 
have to wait for that period of building to the top and then coming down and then going back up with the wall. For the seven zones below, it wasn't a problem because we had plenty of time to backtrack the construction. So there was a big change at the top of the building over the last couple of years, and now that's moving forward. The inner skin at the top will enclose a few spaces that are surrounded by an outdoor observation deck on level 121. And you'll be able to go up there and see the city on nice days and actually go up to level 127. So the highest occupied floor of the Shanghai Tower will be about six to eight meters taller than the highest occupied floor of the Burj Khalifa. The observation deck of the Shanghai Tower will be about a hundred meters taller than the Burj Khalifa. So, and I think that's appropriate because Dubai is a relatively small city compared to Shanghai. Shanghai has 23 million people. I think Dubai has less than a million people. And the view from the top of the Shanghai Zhongxing is incredible. You can see all the way to Pudong Airport, you can see all the way to the Hongqiao Interchange Hub, you can see the Bund. Um, it, it's just a spectacular view from up there. So we have three levels of enclosed observation deck, then we have an outdoor observation deck, and then we have five more levels of public accessible space. So the top of the building is really designed for people. The top of the building here, is 132 and then it spirals down to this point here and then the um, wind turbines will be in this area and this area. Th this model is, a, is about three or four years old but level 121 is uh, about 560, 560 meters in this range right here. So you can see the V-strike sort of allows the building to split and wrap around in a very elegant way. Well, the original plan was to complete it by 2014. And the client has um, allowed things to slow down and improve the quality of the construction and the finishes. So we're, we're looking at finishing in 2015, maybe uh, first quarter, second quarter of 2015. Things on this building that have never been done before and a little bit of cautious Awareness is very astute. Don't rush into things. Because we have this big double skin wall, what we've done is we've concentrated the loads at the amenity floor. So what would be a normal floor movement of 15 to 30 millimeters of differential movement of the curtain wall and the floor slabs, we've concentrated this hanging load so the maximum movement could be 250 millimeters of movement which is a lot of movement. 250 millimeters is about that much movement. So what we had to do was allow this double skin or this hanging structure the ability to move and slide on a system of pins. So there's a pin and then there's a bushing and a bearing that goes over the pin in order to keep everything lined up. That had never been done before. And the function of the outer skin is to distribute the wind loads to the superstructure. 
So we have very high wind loads that make the building move, and as it moves, it tends to slide up and down in these um, amenity floor zones. So it took about a year and a half to get a system that everybody was comfortable with. So the, the thing about tall buildings, they're a marathon, they're not a sprint. Uh, as I said earlier, the Shanghai Zhongxing, I've been working on it for eight years now. The competition started roughly July uh, 2006. So the actual construction started November 2008. So these are so much higher than what we've built before. The Burj Khalifa at 828 meters was, um, Taipei 101 was 508. So we were 308 meters taller than the tallest building. So we, when you're up in this kind of height, a little bit of extra looking at the project is very beneficial. These projects, the Burj Khalifa, uh, the Shanghai Zhongxing, have had um, peer reviews. The structural engineer was peer reviewed by the expert panel in China. The primary structural engineer, Thornton Tomasetti, was reviewed by the Arch engineer of record, Tone G, and even a third engineer looked at it, and uh, Ikati and the Shendai group also looked at the structure of this. So that takes time to make sure everybody's on the same page. So slowing down the construction is just sort of par for the course for these super tall buildings. The, the next six months are going to be very key to completing the building because what we're going to see is we're going to see the enclosure finished and we're going to see the public spaces uh, start to start to take shape. The finishes will start to be put on, the colors will come out, and the finishes will show off the, the quality of the spaces. I think the, the thing that the client group is doing now is very astute. They're actually trying to incorporate the art into the building. Now, there's several ways you can do this. You, you can actually finish the building and then just place sculptures and paintings and artwork around the project. But what we've seen is a strong desire to integrate it into the architecture, into the spaces, into the, the physical pieces of the building. So, since we have columns that are about six meters by four meters, what we've done is we've looked at several artists that are cladding these columns with um, a traditional ceramic material that is modified to a contemporary theme, if you will. So it's the traditional um, Chinese pottery with the blue glaze, and this will cover some of the large elements in the podium. Challenges, that, that's always a question we get. And all the projects I do, I don't like surprises. So if you plan the building correctly, there's no surprises. The surprises come about when the suppliers and the fabricators don't know why you did something. And they offer a substitute that doesn't meet the performance criteria. Those are the only surprises we see. And that just has to do with communication. Um, uh, the first time we were looking at the ceiling in the lobby of the building, uh, we had specified a, a metal panel material of a certain color that was perforated with an absorptive material behind it. Because the lobby has a stone floor, it has glass walls, and it also has glass walls on the core, so it has these hard surfaces that become an echo chamber. So the ceiling had to absorb sound. And some of the first alternatives for the ceiling were these beautiful cloisonne uh, copper panels. They were absolutely exquisite, absolutely exquisite, but basically they wouldn't function from an acoustic standpoint. We needed the ceiling to absorb sound, so we had to go back to the original design and say, the function of the material is to do A, B, and C. If you can meet the function, we can look at the alternate. Those, those seem to be the biggest challenges we have. I mean, the biggest challenge I have is literally, I don't speak Chinese and I don't read Chinese, and I'm, and I'm constantly looking at reports in Chinese, and, but they're drawings, so I can read the drawings. The, the biggest challenge for a Western architect working in China is the process. There's a lot more decisions made later in the process than we would in the West. And this is just a comparison between the two 
uh, means of construction. In the United States, in Europe, in the Middle East, you put together a very strong set of construction documents that the contractor must build to. If he doesn't build to, you could literally say, rip it out, put in what we contracted to build. In China, there's a little bit more process involved where it's more inclusive. And especially with projects like the Shanghai Zhongxing that are um, financed from the government and our government money. So the process has to be more open to a fair bidding process. And we've gone through this with a number of suppliers who submit their uh, company profile, they submit their products, and they submit their price. And um, my role has been to make sure it's fit for purpose in terms of the visual qualities of the material and the performance qualities of the material. Um, I, I tend to stay out of the price decisions. I think the, the client is much more able to negotiate price than I am. So once the, the process um, is allowed to select the material, then it goes ahead and then we work with the contractors to actually make sure everything works out well, the details are all worked out. Um, and I think that is probably the biggest challenge to Western architects but I, I still will go back to the biggest challenge is, is sort of the, the timing of everything. And not, if I wasn't in Shanghai, I would not be involved in the process as much as I am, just because things come up three or four times this week, then maybe we have a couple weeks where we don't do anything, or a month where we don't do anything, and then we do four or five things simultaneously. So th there's a lot of process involved in the final selection of materials and the, the details that go into it. The Burj Khalifa, uh, I, I was the studio head that led the design team for the 828 meter high Burj Khalifa. And the drawings that we did for the project um, were very, very well followed by the contractor, almost, almost to uh, a T. Uh, we, we designed paving patterns of astrolabs that were put into the office drop off that came out absolutely exquisite. And from a Western architect, you're used to designing very detailed drawings that get built exactly like you want. In China, there's a little bit more give and take, where in Dubai, the contractor built what was on the drawings. In China, um, the drawings aren't so complete that it allows the contractor a little bit of freedom and the client's decision-making process allows them the ability to substitute materials as long as they're equal to what was specified. So that slows down the process a little bit to open up the bidding to uh, a number of people to provide services for the project. And I think um, 
I mean, I may be one of the last Laois on the project. There may be a few others, but I rarely ever see a Westerner on site now. And uh, most of the team that's constructing it and working on it is Chinese. And I think that's the way they wanted it. I think they wanted this to be sort of a, a very Chinese project. And I think that's one of the reasons why I stayed in Shanghai, so I can be involved with the project. Um, one of the things that could be said about the design of the Shanghai Tower is that it's very, very similar to the Burj Khalifa. A lot of the lessons learned in the Burj Khalifa are directly translated to the Shanghai Tower. The uh, spiraling nature of the balconies on the Burj uh, were the inspiration for the twisting form of the outer skin. Now, um, when we did the competition in 2006, um, competitions are a vehicle to actually express ideas that are somewhat out in left field, if you will. And the, and the idea of the double skin of the Shanghai Tower came from what we learned on the Burj. Lessons learned on the Burj were directly applied to the concept of the Shanghai Tower because uh, I left SOM in 2006 and we did the competition. I left SOM in March of 2006 and we did the competition in July, August of 2006. So. Uh, three or four months later. So we had just finished up the Burj and we were now working on this new super tall building. And all the things from the wind tunnel testing and the shape of the building was incorporated into this outer skin. Specifically the fact that the Burj we had to rotate twice in order to reduce the wind loads on the building. Or better said, if we optimize the rotation of the building the structure saw less force. And we actually did that once and had to redo the first five floors. And we did it again and had to redo them. And I think uh, for all the architects, they know having worked on a project for a couple of years and having to do major redrawing exercises really demoralizes a team. So the idea of this outer skin was something we could optimize independently from what we were doing on the inside. So we could have one team working on the inside, and that could move a pace, and then the outer skin could be optimized. We could add more twist, less twist. So the concept in the competition was coming up with a set of rules that enabled us to move forward rather quickly on the design of the project. So the outer skin was something we could optimize, and a double skin that acts as a thermal insulation in the winter. Um, so without the Burj, I don't think the Shanghai Tower would look like it does today. The, the concepts in both buildings are very much the same. There's a very rational rigor of design process that went into both buildings. We're talking a little bit about how the Shanghai Tower is the next generation of the Burj Khalifa. Both are super tall buildings, and they have a lot more in common than you would expect. Uh, they both have a very strong rigor in the design process where engineering was integrated into the process very early on. And I would recommend that anyone that does a super tall building should get a, a very good engineer from day one. Um, I think the engineers of this project deserve an incredible amount of credit. Uh, Professor Ding of Tongji, Dennis Poon, Jue, Paul Fu, Paul Lu, the Thornton Tomasetti team, um, the Tongji architects, um, able to integrate this engineering into a work of art that is 632 meters high, is always awe-inspiring to me. Um, but um, going back to this concept of how do you uh, uh, confuse the wind? How do you drop the loads on a building? And that has to do with the shape of the building. The shape of the Burj Khalifa reduces the amount of wind load that the building has to resist. The twisted shape of the Shanghai Tower also reduces the amount of wind. If we twisted more, uh, right now the, the final twist is about 137 degrees plus or minus from bottom to top. And that reduces the wind loads considerably. We estimate it saved about 60 million US dollars in construction cost. 
if we added more twist, we could reduce the loads even further. But the more twist we put in the building, the more it looked bent. And uh, Mr. Gu, one of the first things he said to me is, uh, we don't want the building to look bent. So we had to sort of toe the line between how much twist and um, sort of the look of the building. We, we did a lot of studies with these rapid prototyping models where we had 90 degree twists all the way up to 180 degree twist. And the, the 137, I think everybody agreed, looked the best. Well, uh, the project started in, I, I think, July of 2006. And I, I had just left SOM and I was hired as the director of design for Gensler. And someone came to me and said, uh, Marshall, there's a meeting to go to. And I was really busy at the time with several projects, so I said, I really don't have time. And they said, oh, we need you to go to this meeting. And I said, what's it for? And they said, well, it's for a new project. Would you come? And so I go to this meeting in Pudong, and it turns out to be for what I was told was the world's tallest building at the time. And we had to explain to the client that, no, the Burj Khalifa is being built, that you're not even close. The planning height was 580 meters. And the Burj Khalifa was 820, 818 meters at the time. It was finally finished at 828 meters. So that was about um, uh, what is it? Uh, 580 from 830. What is that? 210 meters lower than the world's tallest building at the time. And I showed him some drawings of the Burj Khalifa at that time and said, no, you're not even close. You need to get up to 880. You have to get to 840 if you're ever going to be taller than that. And, and I think this sums up the client. The Shanghai Tower client is not a reactive client. They're a very thoughtful client. They wanted to be the right height in Lu Jiazui. They just didn't want to be the world's tallest building. At the time, there was Taipei 101 at 508 meters. So they were going to be 580 meters. So they knew they were taller than any existing structure in the world. But the Burj Khalifa had been designed as the world's tallest building. But the client group, I think in their wisdom, said, you know, we don't have to be the world's tallest. We just need to be the right height for this group of buildings in Pudong. And I think they've kept that that idea intact, and I must give them a lot of credit for it because a lot of times when you're doing these super tall buildings, everybody says, well, if we make it a little bit taller, we could be the world's tallest building. When the Jin Mao building was under construction, um, the Petronas Towers was finished. The Petronas Towers are 442 meters high, Jin Mao is 432 meters, 10 meters apart. And there were some studies that Adrian did where he extended the spire another 10 or 12 meters to be taller than Petronas, but it just didn't look right. So this idea of being the tallest is not so important as this idea about being the right size. And when Lu Jiazui was planned in the mid 80s as a collection of three super tall buildings, the, the 600 meter, the 580 meter was the appropriate size for this city and I think still is. And so we sat down and we, we kind of came up with 632. Uh, 6 is 3 times 2. Uh, Jin Mao is uh, 432. WFC is 492. So 632 was a good collection of numbers. And it was the right kind of step, Jin Mao to WFC, and then a little bit taller. So we were about 130% higher than the step from Jin Mao. We said, OK, 632. And it stuck. It stuck. We, did, we didn't change it from that kind of shows you the three buildings. And the idea is Jin Mao is China's past, WFC is China's present, and the Shanghai Zhongqing is China's future. Now, Jin Mao is China's past. It's a stainless steel pagoda. It references historic Chinese architecture. WFC is a Japanese developer, foreign investment coming to China. That is China's present. China's future is a more transparent, a more open idea. And uh, the Shanghai Center was a, bu a building about not having one direction but multiple directions. And that's why it's not one facade but multiple facades. It, it looks in all directions. It doesn't have four facades. It has, um, it, you could say it has 100 and, 
30 some odd facets that go around it on each level. So this idea of past, present, and future is embodied in the three buildings. So the engineering aspect of building tall buildings was at the forefront, but this idea of three brothers that uh, speak to each other in an abstract way or in a way that someone could describe the three buildings on tours that is given of Shanghai. Why, why is that building round and the other two um, more rectangular? And I think um, modern buildings I, I find much more attractive and much more thoughtful than historic buildings, but they're still buildings and they're still built with the way we build today. The construction method of building a one-story building or a hutong or a shikomen in Shanghai was based on how you build it. The idea and shape and form of the Shanghai Tower is planned around how you actually build it and how you construct it. 